by night in the house of the Lord. Lift up holy hands in prayer and praise the Lord and make the Lord who made heaven and earth bless you from his holy hill. So come on, lift up your hands in this house today and let's cry out to the Father. Father, now in the name of Jesus, we stand in the house of God. We're lifting up holy hands. No, we're not holy because of what we've done, but holy because of you and your son. And we ask you, Lord, Lord, would you speak to your people today from your holy hill? I look to the hills where my help comes from. My help comes from the Lord. Rain down in this house today, we pray. Do as you desire. Move in the midst of your people, we pray. In the name of Jesus and all of God's people said, Amen.
coming to where you are, which is right here. I don't have to go far. You're right here with me. Would you sing this with us? that today, no matter what we carry in this room today, Lord, there's some who have not yet called upon you. But Lord, your message to them today is that you are just a call away. That Lord, you will come Lord, before we even take the first step. Once we determine that we have made up our mind that you are our goal. And Father, that we desire you. You said that you would come to us. what happens in this church on Sunday. 
aren't you glad that when we called, he did? That's Advent. Advent means the arrival. And as we worship today, there was a beautiful advent of his presence in this place. He came. He's in this room today. And whatever need you've carried in, you don't got to carry out. There's a good old wooden cross up here. Nail it to it. And leave it there this morning. Jesus. Diane, are you ready? Thank you, Jesus. You have your paper back there. Because it's not up here. Okay. Thank you, Jesus. I love this song that we're about to sing. It's probably the world's most favorite Christmas carol. Not that old. The guy who wrote it didn't think it would amount to much. It was a standby because mice had eaten through the bellows of the church, and he needed an easy song that he could strum on his guitar. Little did he know that this song would be translated into at least 200 languages. It's sung around the world, and the message of the gospel that is in it is amazing. Would you sing this old song with us, Silent Night?
worship team. What a beautiful job you did today in his presence. Amen and amen. Mm, there's a beautiful, sweet presence of the Lord in the house today. You may be seated this morning. Praise God. Turn in your Bible with me this morning, if you would. I don't know. How about the first chapter of Matthew? All right. Mm. I'm thinking I might should preach about, I don't know, something Christmas related today. Is that all right with you? I was leaning towards Easter, but I had a second thought on that. Let him leave. Let him leave. Well, he is. All right, now. Matthew chapter 1. You know, we have looked at the Nativity now and at Advent, the Advent of Jesus, from three different perspectives. We looked at it first from the perspective of the awaiting Israelites, earnestly hoping and desiring the coming of the Messiah, a promise which had been made some 4,000 years before, not yet fulfilled, yet passed down from generation to to generation, the grass withers and the flower fades. But your word, O oh God, it endures forever. Is a promise they held to, believing the Messiah will come. Remember I told you, every year at Passover, they would put out that extra seat for the Messiah to sit in. Because this could be the year that he would come. And so, we looked at it from the perspective of the Israelites. The hope that they had, that the Savior would be born. Then, the next week, we looked at it from the one that we think of most, besides little baby Jesus, when we think of Christmas, the Virgin Mary. Mary being brutally surprised by an angel, saying, guess what, honey? I got good news for you. <laughs> good news? You're a child. Whoa. Oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. I, I thought you said this was good news. Because this is not sounding so good to me here, okay? See, angel, I don't think you understand how this works. Because you're an angel. See, I'm a human, and i got to go be with a man in order to have a kid. And I have Oh, that's no problem for God. You're still going to have a kid conceived by the Holy Ghost, and you're going to call his name Jesus. Well, well we're not at the name yet. I'm still on this whole pregnant thing. How did you, exactly, how did that happen, right? And, but as Mary heard the voice of the angel, because God had been faithful to her before, she was able to overcome her doubt previous, and she was able to take joy in his word. Yeah. Joy that to many other, or news that to many other people would bring sorrow and sadness and whoa, ho, ho, go pick somebody else, not me. To her brought joy. As a matter of fact, it's joy unspeakable and full of glory. When she realized that God had looked down through thousands of years of history and had put his finger on her. A very humbling kind of joy. Then, the next week, we looked at it from the perspective of all the others that were there around, the shepherds and the, I would love to tell you the wise men, but honey, I, I hate to bust your bubble. They came two years later, right? <laughs> But all of the other people there in Bethlehem that day, the thousands who lived there and the thousands who had come there out of compulsion because, as we know the story goes, a decree had been made by Caesar Augustus in those days that all the world should be taxed. And Mary went with his betrothed, and Joseph went with his betrothed wife Mary to Bethlehem, for he was of the line and the lineage of David. And we said to those who could recognize him, to those who could recognize who this little baby was, who he was, it brought peace. You see, the circumstances in their lives had not changed. They still owed the same bills. All right. Right? They still had the same amount of money or no money in the bank. They still had to go pay the taxes, okay? Caesar Augustus wasn't about to say, 
well, it's okay, Jesus is born now, so you don't have to pay your taxes no more. Because there are two things in life which are certain, and what are they, ladies and gentlemen? Death and taxes. Right? As a matter of fact, if Caesar could have figured out, because they were where Jesus was born. Right? So the circumstances in their life had not changed, but for those shepherds, and for those others who beheld him, for Simeon there in the temple, and Anna who saw him and proclaimed and realized the Messiah had come, though circumstances were still bad, though they were still under occupation, though they were still under a heavy hand, though life on the outside and on the surface still sucked. Amen. Yeah. All right now. They had Ooh. peace. Come on. They could say, it's all right. It's all right. Peace. Because his presence was there. Robert Schuller was famous for saying, Peace is not the absence of conflict, it is the presence of God in the midst of chaos. And isn't that good news? But you know, in looking at all these God, at all these perspectives, we've left out somebody. And this one is typically not spoken much of. As a matter of fact, after the second chapter of Luke, we never hear of him again. We never hear of this man who was willing to take on an extreme burden. Who was he? Joseph. See, we think of Mary, the Virgin Mary. We think of baby Jesus, the shepherds, the angels. We even got the wise men who didn't come for a while. But what of Joseph? What was his perspective? Because I can tell you, it wasn't, oh, joy. I can tell you it probably wasn't, oh, yippee, best news I've ever heard. As a matter of fact, my thought is, his perspective probably was, you've got to be kidding. And that's what I want to talk to you about this morning. And I want to talk to you about some lessons we can learn from Joseph that we can, should carry forward, not just at Advent and at Christmas time, but in the way that we should live every single day. Because if the story of the gospel only changes you for one day, then you haven't got the same gospel I got. That's right. That's right. Now, Turn with me to Matthew chapter 1. And could I ask you to stand out of reverence for his word today? Thank you, Jesus. Matthew chapter 1, and we're going to start with verse... What is that? 18. <laughs> Woo. Got all the lights on and I still can't hardly see it. <laughs> this is how Jesus the Messiah was born. His mother Mary was engaged to be married to Joseph. But before the marriage took place, while she was yet a virgin, she became pregnant through the power of the Holy Spirit. Joseph, her fiancé, was a good man. And he did not want to disgrace her publicly. So he decided to break the engagement quietly. And as he considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. Joseph, son of David, the angel said, Do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child within her is conceived by the Holy Spirit, and she will have a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All of this occurred to fulfill the Lord's message through his prophet. Look, a virgin shall conceive a child. She will give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. When Joseph woke up, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded and took Mary as his wife. But he did not have sexual relations with her until after her son was born. And Joseph named him. Jesus. Let's pray. 
Father, we ask you now that you would open the bread of life to us. Let our ears be open so that we would not hear the voice of just another preacher and another sermon, but we would hear the voice of the Holy Spirit speaking to us. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart now be acceptable in your sight, I pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. My goodness, what a good looking crowd you have. Oh, thank you. Well, you're welcome. So picture with me, picture with me, they're sitting there in Nazareth. In Nazareth, they're sitting, ain't nothing on the idiot box to watch that night. Or maybe there was, maybe it was, uh, what was? Dynasty was on, right? <laughs> Dallas was supposed to be on, and Joe was wanting to sit there and watch his old TV do his thing. And you know, one of those uh oh moments takes place. Mary comes out, shuts the TV off, and says, Baby, we gotta talk. Uh -oh. <laughs> Most conversations I can tell you that start that way are not good conversations, right? Now, mind you, Mary had rehearsed this talk probably the whole way over, right? Because remember, they weren't married yet. They were just fiancé. And so she, he was still living at his place. She and hers. And so all the way down the street, just thinking like, well, can I, Joseph, don't be mad. And Joseph, this is how it happened. And she'd already determined in her mind, I'm going to say this, and then he's going to say that, but I'm going to come back, because I'm going to say this. And he's going to say that, and that, you know, right? Because you, you've done the same thing, haven't you? Right? You've thought all these things out. We've all done that. And so Joseph is just wanting to relax. He's planning his whole life. He's at that point in his life as a Jewish young man. He's engaged. And not only is he engaged, he's engaged in the most beautiful girl in town. She's a righteous woman. She loves the Lord. I mean, it couldn't be any better for him. And so in his mind, he's already thinking about, oh, uh, and he's a carpenter, of course, and I want to build this, and I wanna, we're going to have a kid. No, we're going to have a house full of kids. I'm going to have a bunch of strapping young boys. And they're going to learn the carpentry trade. And they're going to they're gonna take my name, and, and our lineage will go on. And, and Mary says, baby, we got to have a talk. <laughs> well, okay. I think if he's like me, he might have said, like, is this that urgent? Can this not wait? <laughs> I can have some room for you, you know, next month. <laughs> right? Because ain't nobody like controversy, right? Nobody likes tension. Nobody likes the idea of a problem. Right. Right? And so Joseph probably was a typical dude and would have just been fine with her not telling him. Maybe as she told him, she, he was worried that maybe she was going to complain about that the wedding dress wouldn't be ready in time. Or, or that the place where the marriage ceremony was supposed to take place had, had canceled on them and, and wouldn't marry their type. Or, or whatever the case might be. Right. And she breaks not just bad news, but the worst possible news that anybody could have given him Honey, I'm pregnant. Whoa. Now, see, some folk might be row row because they're like, well, we're not married and our own people are fine. But it wasn't even that. They hadn't been, you know, together. So it wasn't like, uh oh, I'm going to be in trouble with my parents. It was, uh oh, she been with somebody else. Like we said a few weeks ago. He was ready to take her on the Mort Povich show. Oh, yeah. You are not the baby's father. Right? Uh, don't do that. This thing better cooperate with me here. This is going to drive me nuts. You know, we're just going to get her. You know what? I got a big mouth. You didn't need to say amen. <laughs> so she comes in and says, I'm pregnant, but, 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 wait, baby, because you can already see probably the steam starting to come out of you. You know, there's certain 
would be a good way to tell if I'm getting upset, watch the back of my ears. Uh -huh. That's the first way. Because here, this is usually going to be a blank expression. But here, this gives it away. And his ears probably, I bet you, George, they began to turn red. And she saw it and she said, no, 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 no. You don't understand. What do you mean I don't understand? I know how this works, baby. No, 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 no. I haven't been with nobody. Sure. Yeah, I just... <laughs> mm -hmm. Right. Uh-huh. Why, this child is from the Holy Ghost. Yeah. Oh, oh my. <laughs> and then, exactly, <laughs> because it was already bad enough that she's pregnant, now she's going to throw blasphemy in with it. Uh, of course That's his perspective. That's where he sat. That's reality. All right. All right. Right. Because God had not yet spoken to him. Oh, right. Yes. Oh, yeah. He hadn't heard the voice of the angel yet. Oh. And so what he was telling, was being told, was the most preposterous, unbelievable thing ever proclaimed, not just in Israel, but in the whole world throughout all, into, throughout all time. You don't just get pregnant by the Holy Ghost. Because <laughs> right, if that were the case, you'd have had about 20 kids. I can only imagine that after the anger of it, after the anger, after the anger of the betrayal, how agonizing it must have been. If you've ever been with somebody and you got cheated on, you'll understand. Yeah. And that must have been his perspective that day. Because it went from anger to agonizing sorrow. Because in a fleeting moment, just in that split second, his life had changed. And that which she had desired and dreamed and been building for now for a period of time, the money he'd been squirreling away so that he could build her a nice home, that he could take care of her, all for naught. She betrayed him. It's a very agonizing situation. I mean, worst of all, it's not something that he could even talk to anybody about. Because ain't nobody ever been heard a story like that. And nobody would understand. Nobody would understand. Nobody would give him any sympathy. His parents would likely say, well, see, we told you not to pick that one. Because right. <laughs> you know how them in-laws can be. Yeah. <laughs> Probably running through his mind was, I thought I knew her. Yeah. I thought I knew who she was. Right, how could I be so stupid Jeez. as to believe? as to have fallen for her. How? How is it possible? But I think likely deep down in his heart, deep down in his heart, he suspected maybe with a slim sliver of possibility, could it be true? Could what she's telling me be true? Because I do know her. I do know who she is. Hmm. But I think that he made up his mind early on, keep your head down and don't think about it. Mm. Basically, keep yourself occupied. Yeah. Go to work, stay busy yeah. so you ain't got to think. Isn't that what we do with our problems? Yeah. Yeah. Those problems are there, we don't want to deal with them, and so we try to go find something else to go do so that we don't actually have to go deal with the problem. And so likely he would go to that carpenter's shop and bang away and saw away till the wee hours of the night. But the night always came. Oh, come on. And while he could keep his mind occupied during the day, he would lay on his bed at night, no doubt. All these thoughts running through his mind. Mm -hmm. I thought I knew her. How could she betray me? But could it be true? Is it possible? You see, there are really only for him two options. Well, maybe three. Two only up, two major options, and a third one, a very slim possibility. The first one was what the law required of him as an upstanding citizen of Israel to do, and that was to report her. 
He was, he was to report her to the Sanhedrin, and she would be taken out and stoned mm. at dawn. Because she had committed an egregious violation of the law. She had been with another man before they had been married. God had said no. It was settled that she should die. At least this is how he looked at it. And so, she should be stoned. But in his mind, like you, I see some cringes on you. Like you, the thought was likely unthinkable. That while she had betrayed him in his mind, and while he believed that he couldn't believe what she had done, he could not bring this one because he did love her. He had fallen for her. He could not bring himself yeah. to have her killed. Yeah, Pastor. The second option, <coughs> far more palatable. He couldn't overlook what she had done. He rationalized. But I cannot link my reputation and everything I've built with an adulterous woman. And so, I will put her away quietly. We are not yet married, we are only engaged. And so we will break off the engagement. I will put her away. She will live the rest of her life with her illegitimate child in shame. But at least she won't die. I can pick up the pieces. I can continue to live my life. I can find a new bride. I can still have the children. My dreams can still come into reality. There really was no downside to this, was there? And then there was option three. Marry her and raise an illegitimate child and be forever tarnished. Lose most of his business because people probably weren't going to have anything to do with him because he was with her. And so, we don't know how long it took, but I think over a period of time, Joseph made up his mind. He prayed, he prayed and prayed, and he heard nothing. Heaven was silent, and so he made a decision, and he came to peace at, with that decision and said, I'm going to go ahead and break things off with her. That's what we read. He had determined to put her away quietly. And probably had decided tomorrow I'll do it. And much like Mary had rehearsed the whole speech, he had already rehearsed it, run it through in his mind. He had made his plan. It had been resolved. It was done. And laying on his bed that night, it seemed clear as he drifted off to sleep. And then God spoke. Mm. And might I say, God's a bit rude. <laughs> oh, you're like, wait a minute, how could you say that? You see, he wakes up the next morning, and as he's getting, he remembers a virgin, and Jesus, and save their people from their sins, and you should marry her. But wait a minute, God, I had made up my mind. I had a plan put together. God, why didn't you tell me this before I had my plan? You see, God's not so concerned about our timing and our planning. We are, right? You see, Joseph had laid out, had thought about how things would be. He had rationalized why God didn't need Joseph. You somebody else. You know why I said he was rude? Why God said he was rude? Because the first thing he tells him is, do not be afraid. Now I bet you Joseph probably sat there for a little bit and said, wait a minute. I'm not scared. I'm trying to do the right thing. That's all. I'm just trying to do the right thing. I, I got a choice between either her being stoned or me putting her away quietly and being able to go on. I'm just trying to do the right thing. I'm not scared. But the truth of the reality is he was. Mm. You see, God spoke to that thing in him that even Joseph was not willing to admit. And see, God, when he speaks to you, the very first place he will speak to you at, and the very first thing that he'll put his finger right on, is that thing that you don't want him touching. Oh, yeah. That's the first oh, thing he goes to. Oh, you see, when
what motivated, what motivated Joseph at that point was fear. There was no faith. There was no, oh, could it possibly be? He'd already pretty much put that out of his mind, even though there probably had been that thought early on. Oh, what if? Oh, it could be, maybe. But remember, it said he had made up his mind. Yeah. Which means that he had listened to the fear side yeah. and had not even gone to the Father and said, Oh God, could this possibly even be true? Mm. You see, God puts his finger when he begins to speak to you. He puts his finger right where you are. Not where you want him to be. <laughs> he will mess with That's you right. and he will be rude about it. That's right. That's right. Or at least it comes across to us that way. The second thing that was rude about it was that he'd already made up his mind as to what he was going to do. God didn't speak to him while he didn't have, while he yet had an open mind. All right. Don't you think that maybe he stood there shaking his fist at God and said, God, for X number of days I have battled with this and I've not known what to do. And now that I've finally made up my mind, now that I've finally put this to rest, now that I'm finally at peace with it, you have the audacity to come walking in here with an angel and tell me that what I've come up with ain't good enough for you. Ah! Come on. Yeah. Come on. Tell it. Right, man. Jeez. God, God speaks to us well, at the very first inclination we had, see, Joseph's very first thought of could it possibly be was probably the voice of the Spirit saying, listen. But see, we begin to listen so much to the other voices. Right? So much of the other voices may begin to drown out. And so that very first instinct, that still small voice that we heard at the very outset where God was speaking begins to be drowned out. Mm -hmm. God is yet speaking and yet we are no longer listening. Oh, you see, the likelihood is the very first day God had already spoken to him. But like Joseph, we agonize over decisions even though we already know All right. the decisions he has for us. That's right. yes, we do. Mm -hmm. A subtle sense of direction, so soft that if we don't pay close attention to it, we'll discount it completely. And our agony is driven mostly by fear. Fear of what will happen to me if I go through with this. Fear of, this is not my plan. And fear of, I ain't got no control in this. Oh boy. Now, look, I, I'm just going to speak right from my... I don't know where y'all are. I know where I am. I like... Fair, it's going to be a big surprise to you. It's a big surprise. Are you ready? I like being in charge. I know, I know, I know. Really, it's true. See, right? And Carlos, trust me. See, I like being in charge. And so when God begins to speak to me and say... Uh, yeah, your plan that you have, not so much. <laughs> Change of plans, here you go, and he lays the plan out for me. The problem I have with it is, A, I didn't come up with it. And B, I ain't got no same control on how steps B, C, D, E, and F are going to work out in this plan. Yes, there you go. Because, see, I like to have contingencies. Yeah. Uh -huh. What if step A doesn't quite work? Well, then there's step A sub point Roman numeral I. Yeah. Right? And then I've got all these things lined up because I need to be in charge. And Joseph, he's a man. He needed to be in charge. That's his society. It's how he was raised. It's how he was taught. You're the man. You need to be in charge of things. And here God was taking all control away from him. And the first thing the angel had the audacity to tell him is do not be afraid. <laughs> Why, of course I'm afraid. Come on now. Of course oh, I am. Jeez. It's true. The second thing the angel says, essentially, is it okay if I paraphrase it? Amen. Go through with it. All right. There you go. All right. Go through with it and do what, I, what he's told you to do. Again, fear begins to paralyze him because he has completely forgotten Jeremiah 29. I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. I remember I was agonizing over something that didn't quite go the way that I wanted it. 
And I remember this was early on at Community Gospel, and I walked in to Pastor Chris's office. And those of you who know Pastor Chris sometimes know that he can just be really blunt and tell you exactly how it comes oh, yeah. oh, to yeah. his mind. Good, wise words. And I sat there, and he let, and of course he'll let you boo-hoo and whine, too. <laughs> and I sat there, and boo-hoo and whine. I told him my sob story of how this I had this thing hadn't gone the way that I had envisioned it. It was just so terrible. And then Chris made that long pause. Remember how you would do that? Stare at you. Then uh, the bottom lip begins to purse a little bit. Hmm. And then he says. So what you're saying is, you don't believe that God wants the best for you. All right. Oh. Well, that's not what I'm saying. Yes. Yes, that's what you're saying. No, it's not. Listen, baby, don't argue with me. Yes. It isn't that the truth. We fret and we worry when things don't go our way because we have forgotten completely Jeremiah 29. I know the plan. Even when I screw them all up. Even when in my stupidity I do something dumb. His plan is still good for me. You see, he already made all the Roman numeral I's and double I's and three I's and he's got all that out that when you start messing it up, he says, okay, no problem. Next section. He's got a diagram bigger than all of heaven for your life and all of it points to good and that's what Joseph could not see that day. Joseph could only see, you want me to marry this woman? Do you know what you're asking me to get into? And when God speaks to us, when God says, I need for you to do X, Y, or Z, the very first thing that comes to our mind is, do you know what you're asking me? Yeah. Now maybe he didn't do that. Maybe maybe he just got up and said, yeah, okay. No problem. But you know, I think he did because that seems to be the pattern in the scripture, isn't it? When the angel came to Sarah and Abraham, who were so old that they couldn't have a kid and said listen sweetheart you about to have a baby she laughed so hard she almost <laughs> fell over <laughs> that was the dumbest thing she'd ever heard she said listen angel I don't know if you understand how this works much yeah. like Mary yeah. I'm 99 years old mm -hmm. that don't work no more <laughs> <laughs> When Elijah, one of, the, one of the greatest prophets of the Old Testament, after one of his greatest victories at Mount Carmel, he became so discouraged that he went into a wilderness, lay down, and said, God, kill me right here. God said, get up and go from here. I got work for you to do. No. I'm just gonna die right here. You want me to go and do what? You have gotta be kidding me. Jonah. God speaks to Jonah and says, Jonah, I need for you to go down to Nineveh and go preach repentance to them. And Jonah says, no way, no how, uh-uh, not going to happen. No ifs, no ands, no buts about it. I ain't going. As a matter of fact, he booked a ticket on a ship going as far in the opposite direction as he could because he was not about to go tell those filthy, nasty Ninevites about God because he wanted God to kill them all. You want me to go to Nineveh? You got to be kidding me. Yes. Saul. While he was still called Saul before he became Paul, was so convinced of the dangers of these new followers of Jesus 
that he believed it was God's will yeah, yeah, yeah. for him to be torturing them and to put them yeah. to death, mm -hmm. yeah. throwing them in prison. Yeah. And on a road to Damascus, God knocked him off his horse. And don't you know Paul had to have said, what? But I've been doing this. You see, each of them had resolved, each had made up their mind. Every single one of them had said, this is the way it should be. And God spoke. Yeah. That's right. And Sarah had a child. And Elijah heard a still small voice and he lived. And, and old Jonah, he ended up in Nineveh and a city was transformed. And Paul, our former Saul, became the greatest apostle of the New Testament and wrote most of the canon of Scripture. You've got to be kidding me. Many times God speaks to us and we have that same reaction, much like Joseph. So I don't blame Joseph. I don't blame Joseph. As a matter of fact, I can relate with Joseph. I think we can too. We don't pay enough attention to this poor man. You see what God was asking him to do. What God was asking him to do was to give up his life. Oh, come on now. That's what he was asking. All my plans, all my dreams, my past successes, my future acclaims, I gotta give all that up. You mean I have to lay down my life? You gotta be kidding me, Mom. You know the gospel and God are full of those? Turn the other cheek. You have got to be kidding me. If that Ken Chong, if I can get around him, I'm not going to try to get a cheek. I'm going to slap him on one. <laughs> right? Love my enemy. Don't look at him now. <laughs> Love my enemy. Are you kidding me? Go and sin no more. Do you know who I am? <laughs> Go and sin. You have got to be kidding me. Deny yourself. No. Uh -uh. Pick up your cross. All together, you gotta be kidding me. That's what I'm sure. Look, Joseph probably had it because we have it. Because when we read these passages of scripture, that's our reaction. But let's not over-spiritualize this. The pastor gets up and says, you should tie. What? You've got to be kidding me. 90% goes further than 100. Uh, <laughs> Life and death in the power of the tongue. You haven't seen my doctor's report. You've got to be kidding me. Come on, Pastor. Let the weak say I am strong and let the poor say I am rich. Have you looked at my bank account? <laughs> I'll get, I'll get no matter what your political persuasion is in this room. Love Obama? Love John Boehner? What? You gotta be kidding me! But see, God calls us to do things that are not of ourselves. You see, if it was just you getting to live your life the way you wanted it, then you didn't need Jesus. You didn't need him. You see, Joseph... Joseph is a perfect example of what Jesus did. You see, Christmas is not so much about a little manger in Bethlehem, although that's all beautiful. But Christmas would have no meaning without a Good Friday. And a Good Friday would have no meaning without an Easter. You see, the only reason that baby was born was to die. That was the sole purpose. There is no greater love than this, but that a man lay down his life for his friends. You see, in Romans chapter 12, it says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your body as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable, and pleasing for God, because this is your reasonable act of worship. The actual word is service. The actual word is service. Well, let me ask you here now. Does God need your sacrifice? No. 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 All right. 
Because as I understood it, there were three words uttered at Calvary that settled it for all time. And no further sacrifice was necessary. It is finished. Done. Settled and complete. There was no more sacrifice for sins necessary. But when he says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your body as a living sacrifice, it was that you would be willing to lay your life down as an act of service for others. As Joseph did when God spoke that he listened and said, yes, I will do this. You see, at first it was for Mary because he did love her. At first it was for Mary, but then he looked beyond that and he remembered the voice of the angel. He said, this child that she will bear, you will name. You will name him Jesus, which means the Lord, my salvation. You will name him. You will give him the name that is above every other name. You will do that. You will have that honor. Yes. You will do that because he has come to save his people from their sins. And when he was talking about his people, he wasn't just limiting it to the Jews, but he was talking about all mankind. Red and yellow, black and white, they are precious in his sight. Jesus loves the little children of the world. Don't make me turn this back into Sunday school. But folks, the love of God was manifested in Joseph that day. And we should be looking and we should say, you know what? In the middle of an agonizing and difficult situation, when I hear the voice of God, Paco, I simply need to say, yes. Even if it's not what I want to do. Even if it disrupts all my plans. Even if it flies in the face of all my fear. I can trust because I know the plans he has for me. That's right. And he's put his love in my heart. And now I am to lay down my life for my friends. Well, my friends, okay, fine. I'll be nice to my friends. But those enemies. Hmm. Don't care about them none. You know what? They can stick it where the sun don't shine. Uh (laughs) I'm done with that. But God says in Romans 5, God demonstrates his perfect love to us in this. See, when there's a demonstration, what's the purpose of demonstration? Demonstrating something. So that you can do it yourself. See, when I train a new employee at work, I demonstrate it for them first. I show them, here's how you roll a pretzel or how to make a cookie or how to decorate or whatever. Right. <laughs> here's how you do it. This is, this is the way. It's not because I just want them to know how to do it. Okay. I want them to do it. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, God demonstrates oh, yeah. his love to oh, us yeah. in this. While we were his enemies. He died for us. Now, before Michelle goes and gets the hammer and the nails and we start nailing people on the cross up, (laughs) we're done? (laughs) Easter. Easter. Before we start going and doing all that, he's not asking for you to die a physical death, but he is asking you to give up your will today. That when he speaks, I'll say, okay. All right. Let me wrap this up today. That's not always easy. I don't know, Kyle, how am I doing? Have I have I used any of my talking points today? Oh, I see. You'll have to tell me later on what they are. It's a story on every TV channel this time of year. But a man but a man named George Bailey. George has an adventurous spirit and his life is filled with great decisions and ambitious plans to get himself out of the tiny hamlet of Bedford Falls. Is any of you familiar with the story? Yep. Yeah. Mm-hmm. What is it? It's a wonderful life. That's right. Oh, okay. But these plans get thwarted every step of the way, right? Mm-hmm. 
He's all packed for college when his father has a stroke and George must take over the family building and loan. His brother comes from college with a new wife and a promising job. And again, George's plans and dreams take a back seat. He gets married and is on his way to the honeymoon when there's a run on the bank and his bride must use the honeymoon money to help out the building and the loan's clients. At every turn, George has resolved to do big things, grand things, but it is never meant to be. And yet, as he discovers with the help of an angel named Clarence, he is deeply loved, and he's had an impact way beyond what he could have imagined. He realizes, as we do, that it's a wonderful life. Just a second, I'm missing part of my notes. <laughs> <laughs> Uh -oh. Uh -oh. Let it go. Well, you're not going to get the rest of the stories. <laughs> but actually, when you watch the movie all the way through, you're going to find there is a little character that's kind of in the background, not much mentioned. The one where the angel Clarence gets the information from to give to George. Remember who it was? His name was Joseph. Now, pure coincidence. But I think today that we can learn. Joseph's long gone in heaven. You can't talk to him. He's gone. You'll see him one day. But boy, if he could stand in front of you today and talk to you, if the advice that you could get from heaven, from him would be, go ahead and do what God has called you to do. Mm. Because if you do, you will experience more love than you ever give away, and you will find that the abundant life that you end up having is a crazy abundant life. Yes, right. Far beyond anything you ever possibly dreamed. Right. Now to him who is able ah. to do exceedingly and abundant, far above and beyond anything that I could ever ask, hope, think, or even dare to imagine, to him be praise and glory forever. You can have the abundant life today if you'll simply be willing to lay your life down. Like Joseph, get past your you got to be kidding me moment and be willing to love God and love others enough to say, I will lay my life down for my friends. Let's pray. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Can I have you just to dim the lights for me this morning? Jesus. Can we stand in this room this morning? I look at this reef down here and I see all this light and the scripture comes to mind. To people dwelling in darkness, there has shown a wonderful light. My friend, you might be here this morning and you may have all of your plans and all of your dreams and everything laid out before you. And today in this service, you've heard God speaking. And your first inclination is, but God, you got to be kidding me. You see, the first step is a hard step. It is scary. And God's speaking right to that. He says, but you can trust me, baby. You can trust me. Today, I would encourage you in this room without great fanfare, without a whole bunch of hoopla. Remake your commitment to God today and say, I will give up my life. What you ask me, the things you ask me to give up, I'll gladly give them up in order that I may gain my life. You said in your word, he who lays down his life for my sake, he shall gain it.
This morning, my friend, the altar is open. If today you and Jesus just need to have a little talk and make things right, I can tell you he waits for you with open arms. He looks to you and says to as many as come to me, I will in no way reject them. All are welcome. If you need prayer this morning or if you just need to make some, spend some time with Jesus, the altar is open. We'll be glad to have some folks to pray with you as well.
what we want in order to attain, God, that what you have for us. Father, now as we prepare to go from this place, watch over us, your people. Let the love of God go before us and let the light of God in us shine for all the world to see. And we ask all of these things. bless you and protect you. May the Lord smile on you and be gracious to you. And may the Lord show you his favor and give you his peace. Our worship is not over. Our service has just begun. Let's go and be the people of God. Amen. I love you all. Merry Christmas. Hope to see you on Tuesday. Thanks for taking the time to watch this video of one of our worship services at Gateway of Hope Church. At Gateway of Hope, we exist for one simple reason. That is to connect real people to a real God in a real way. If that's happened to you while watching this video, then please let us know. You can contact us via our website at gatewayhouston.org. We would also love to meet you in person. We worship together Sunday mornings at 11 a.m with Sunday School at 9.30. Our worship center is located at 12440 Oxford Park Drive in Houston. Directions to our worship center can be found on our website. We look forward to meeting you in person very soon. Until then, God bless you, and thanks for watching.